week nine and we continue with gpio general purpose input output so let's make a quick recap and just try to remember what we were up to well this is the chip um, this is the card that you're using but this course is called microprocessors so actually what we're interested in is this card only i'm this guy here let me just show you this one here sorry let me make a five and this guy here this one only so this is the chip guys this is the microprocessor that you use we have the alu somewhere here alu you have the registers everything is here but if you look close closely on your card you've got another one here the same one there's another card here why do we have this well, uh, we will begin to answer questions like these because we weren't answering these questions beforehand. Because why do we have two of the same processes on our card? Because this is an educational card. I mean, most of you might have an answer for this. You are guessing why it is. Because this is an educational card. You can connect it to your computer and your card can speak to Kyle. Kyle, Kyle. The interface, the uh, integrated uh, development environment, IDE. So while it's speaking to it, you, you're loading your codes into the card. Well, there is a job on, on the side of the card that must be done. Actually, this is the guy doing it. This is a microprocessor with its own code. So this guy has a separate, uh, mm, separate uh, instruction memory, data memory, but you cannot change it. It is like the example that we give for washing machines. Well, there is a microprocessor in your washing machine and your, I mean, a dishwasher, whatever. And there's, they have their own instruction memory, data memory, if they need to read something or write a code. But you cannot change them, we said, you remember? So this is the washing machine part of your card. It is programmed to let this microprocessor or the ports connect to the computer, speak to Kyle or uh, Texas Instruments have another uh, IDE, which is called Composer, to the integrated development environment that this card needs to speak. This guy takes care of it. So this is the this is the soldier here. This is the environment that you work on, and this environment has these uh, components: arithmetic logic unit and inside the card and the ports. And actually, to connect to these ports, you have some digital pads as well, these digital pads on the microprocessor, somewhere here maybe. So this digital pad, port, port A is here, port F is here. So it is like a small digital pad circuitry, okay? That circuitry is actually this, okay? And the pins, that go out of this circuitry, eight bit pins, because each port has eight bit pins. You can see them here because they're connected. So each pin is connected like this. As you can see, there are red lines. They're connected to, for example, this guy that's connected to port B. So port B is some, must, must be somewhere around here, I'm guessing, on the architecture. Well, the architecture, I don't know if it's, you can see it, you can find it on the internet. Uh, you, most probably you can because this is an ARM uh, microchip and ARM is selling that architecture so that Texas Instruments can produce it. So if you want to produce it, you can just buy it by the copyright of that architecture and produce it. So if it is so, if you can buy it, it must be, I mean, something open, open source. And if we, if you're if you are good computer architectural uh, scientists, we can just observe it and see that ah oh, there is this. There is this digital pad here, and you've got the components. Okay, so this was roughly what we had on the card, and I think you now have you now have a, a rough idea of these ports being on the card. I mean, very simply put, they are like this: input output ports. But we are not sure of the capabilities of the card because we have talked about them. There are some capabilities of the card. We said that these input output ports uh, can be for anything, for connecting anything. And we said that we've already connected, since this is an educational card, 
some of these switches are already connected to some of these pins here. So PF1, PF2, PF0. So actually these switches are connected to port F0 and bit four, PF0, PF4. And this LED here, little LED here is connected to PF1, PF2 and PF3. It was written here, remember? But can I connect something else to it? Yes, you can, because you have PF1 here as well, as you can see. If you want to connect something else, you can connect it as well. But that's already connected. So PF3, PF, so these are the connections. But they're also connected to here, already connected to the LED. And we are going to do experiments of that. So about the architectural connections, we have an idea. But we still don't know how to control them, how to make this work because there's a mechanism in this pad, digital pad, digital port that we're talking about. There's a mechanism here uh, that was constructed for us to control the ports. Okay, so let's read the sentences in this slide. So each port is a pad, a digital circuitry, a separate hardware, a physical block on the microprocessor. We got that. These pads have several specific registers. Registers, I'm like, I always have the same analogy, like hotel rooms with hotel room numbers on them. These registers control the usage of these ports. So these ports have many functions. You can connect digital inputs, ARP outputs, do different things. Well, you can change their uh, functions by changing these registers, okay? And actually, how does it work uh, is written in the data sheet. And you're going to check the data sheet, don't worry. And some of the registers are used to enable the port, some other for other purposes. We are going to go over the purposes in a couple of slides, in a couple of minutes. And finally, the most important thing is these registers are like memory locations. What did this mean? I'm going to go over this again. So guys, imagine you have a data memory. Let's say this is the data memory. Okay. Data memory. And in data memory, you have cells, right? And each cell, you have a name for it. So at 20 million, this is like hotel room. This is the hotel room number. And you have eight bit values in it. This was the memory, right? This was the memory. So to reach this part of the memory, you were using pointers. Remember, so if you write a code like this, I'm writing it to here, LDR, let's say R0, 20 million. And let's say SDR, R1, to square bracket R0, which will make this one a pointer pointing to this location. It would write the value inside R1 to the four locations here. So this was the way we have reached this, these four locations. Okay, oh, it's okay. So how to reach these guys? Actually, each register here has also a number like an hotel number, uh, door number. So for example, this guy, this guy is written here, this guy, this guy is actually this register. And it has this value. So if I had this number instead of this number here, so imagine I'm not using this number, I'm using this one, then the value of R1 wouldn't have been written to here, but it would have been written over here. That's how I reach the control registers. This phenomenon is called memory mapped IO. So registers are, these are control registers, which are memory mapped. A certain part of the memory address like these are mapped to this register so that when I try to reach that address, Actually, I'm not reaching physically the memory, but I'm reaching these registers because these registers and this device is also connected to my microprocessor via the address bus and the data bus. Any questions about memory mapped control registers? Good, good. Okay, so uh, this, uh, thing is being explained in more detail in this slide. Let's go over it once again. So if something is connected to port F, actually two slides earlier, we said that two switches and an R uh, RGB LED is already connected to some pins of port F. 
then we can read or write these devices by simply reading and writing to memory location. Actually, this example, this control register that we give is a specific example, guys. These registers are important, but this is the most important one because whatever we write here, this is an 8-bit register, 8-bit register. So whatever we write here, actually we are, we are connecting to the pins of port F1, port F0. These are pins. So if you write something to it, and if, these, if this pad is configured as an output pin, actually you're changing the output. Or if you read it, if it's an input, we are going to get there. So actually this is the data register we're going to cover. But before being able to do this, we have to configure this device. We have to configure it in such a way that we can read and write to these data registers and we'll see the things that we write on an output port and we'll see it here, okay? We'll see it here. Okay, how to configure it? In order to configure an output digital output port or an input port, a GPIO port, you have to change certain bits in certain control registers of a port. Okay, which pins? Well, for different purposes, we'll make different types of initializations, okay? I'm, I will start with the very, very basic one. Very, very basic one, which will be initializing the LEDs. And after we initialize the LEDs, LEDs we'll be able to use the LEDs. We'll, we'll write simple programs, which will control the LEDs. Actually, we are going to go over the program today. And next week, I'm going to show you on camera. I'm going to write a code and show you on camera. Oh, look, a LED is blinking. Before being able to do this, we'll have to configure the device. Actually, uh, we have talked about this the previous week as well. This could be a GPIO pad connected to the microprocessor or some other device. Actually, um, if you become a hardware programmer, an embedded systems programmer, uh, whatever, I mean, if you will be programming hardwares in assembly or C, doesn't matter. What you're going to do is you're going to connect devices to the microprocessor and you're going to be controlling these devices by configuring their registers. And to be able to do this, you're going to op open the data sheet. You're going to read the data sheet and say that, okay, if I change these bits, I'll configure the device so that I could communicate with the device for if it's a communication uh, interface, whatever. Or if there's a GPIO, I'll be able to send pin, uh, bits in these pins and whatever. So what we are doing for the first time in this course is actually a story of a lifetime. If you become an embedded programmer, you'll be programming some embedded devices by changing these controlled registers, which you will always call initialization. Şuradan suyumu alacağım arkadaşlar. Okay, so we'll start with a very simple initialization procedure. Okay, so since this is a GPIO port, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use some of these registers because there are many registers. First, I'm going to tell this guy if this is an analog port or a digital port. Because guys, from uh, electronics one and electronics two, you're, you're familiar with the fact that if you connect a circuit with an analog device, which has high current output, you will need a different type of circuitry. You'll need to protect your circuit because high load of current might come in. You have designed or worked on op amps and other kind of analog devices for this purpose. But when it comes to digital circuitry, flip-flops or other types of designs, we have very low currents. What is important in th that type of circuitry is you have zero volts or high voltage one, which may correspond to 3.3 .3 volts in our case, or five volts, depending on the type of circuitry. Uh, by the way, I'm going to ask you questions, guys. Uh, the flip-flops or this kind of circuitry, you, do you see it in electronics too? Selçuk Hoca gösteriyor mu bunları? Yoksa sadece şeyin dersinde mi görüyorsunuz? Barbaros'un dersinde mi? Hocam, Selçuk Hoca'nın dersinde daha yeni yeni geçmeye başladık. Yani diferansiyel şey, e, çıkartma işlemleri gibi şeyleri gördük hafiften ama okay, daha sonuçta, iyi yani, e, Ama Selçuk Hoca'nın ders dediğiniz şey, Selçuk Hoca'nın ders dediğimiz şey e, elektronik 1 değil mi? Yok, elektronik 2'ye geçtik hocam. Ha, bu dönem elektronik 2 var değil mi? Tabii 200'den. Okey. 
So it must be electronic equipment. Harun hocam dersin ama sizin dediğiniz gibi voltaj sınırlarını gördük. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. Very good. I'm very glad to hear this. Thank you very much by, for the answer by the way. Okay then. Uh, so uh, so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is this card is fantastic in the sense that you can connect analog devices like an analog sensor which works in currents maybe it's a sensor which provides high currents or you can connect digital devices as well like a led these types of devices require different electrical circuits um, interfaces so the card has this pad has the necessary circuitry to provide operation for both but you need to tell the guy because the guy this pad if it's going to process analog input output it would just uh, operationalize another part of the circuitry so that it will be able to for example protect itself from the current coming in or out so it will operationalize it will enable some part of its own circuitry or if it's a digital circuit it will just operate safely for example but you need to tell the guy you need to tell the guy that hey port f i'm going to connect a digital element to this pin of yours for example pin 3 of yours you need to tell the guy because it has the capability to mm, configure itself so you have a register for it and you're going to do it because we are going to be uh, connecting a digital pin a digital led because leds are digital devices they are simple you just provide you, they, they don't need much current you just provide some current and voltage they just provide some energy that's the nice thing about light emitting diodes and you see mm -hmm. light emitting diodes in hocam bir uh, soru sorabilir miyim please. izniniz olursa please. hocam peki hani biz diyoruz ya bu kartlar çok küçük voltajlarla akımlarla çalışıyor mm -hmm. mesela diyelim ki fabrikalarda otomasyon olan fabrikalarda robotik şeyler kullanılıyor ya Onlar da yüksek volt gerekecek. Yes, yes. O zaman bu durumda nasıl bir sistem izleyeceğiz? Well, uh, Ides Hoca has a, fun, a wonderful course for that, Power Electronics, guys. When hmm. you're deal dealing with electronics elements and high power, the circuitry design changes. And that's a field of uh, power electronics. And Ides Hoca is a master of that field. Well, take that course, okay? Because that's the, beyond the scope of this course. In this course, we are microprocessor guys. We are dealing with very, very low currents. We are dealing with the logic of it. So it is like you are going to be make in our course in the microprocessor, you are going to make a decision in those pins with low current. And that decision, whether it's a high level or low level, that digital decision will be sent to the power electronic device, which will understand the decision, the pins and ones and zeros, and provide necessary currents and voltage for that power element, which is a robotics device or a hydraulic element, whatever. So they are the separate parts of the device. But good question, of course. Thank you. Okay, yeah. If you're interested in power electronics, guys, İles Hoca bu arada yani e, çok iyidir. İles Hoca biz asistan da benim öğrenciyken. Yani bir, bir sene önce asistanlığı bitmişti. E, tam o işin adamı yani. Mutlaka ilginiz varsa İles Hoca'nın dersini alın. Şanslısınız yani bu okulda. Her okulda İles Hoca gibi bir tane adam yok. Ne ee, için biliyorsunuz hocam? Bu elektronik devrelerin hani şu anki mesela bu yaptığımız küçük kartların büyümüş hali gibi bir şey mi? No, no, no, no, no. Uh, the small cards, the microprocessors that we are working on will be always used for decisions. The smart part of the card. But making an heavy robotic arm move requires certain power analog elements. That's a circuitry design. That's the design of the machine. We'll, we are the we are the brain, guys. Micro, we are the microprocessors. We will be the thinking part. But the muscles is power electronics. And that's a different field. We'll be commanding okay. them, but they are the powerful elements. They will be doing the job. Kind of. Okay? But that's okay. a different field. That's a different field. Okay. That's why, I mean, there are different fields of electrical and electronics engineering. That's why we need them. So guys, so for that purpose, we have this circuitry because you could connect an analog sensor as well. We'll connect analog sensors in the next course. Uh, or another register for disabling the alternative functions. Well, I make a definition here, alternative function. Well, the nice thing about this card is guys, nice thing about this card is these ports, these six ports from A to F, a, B, C, D, F, 
They are 8-bit ports, general purpose input I.O. ports, uh, input output ports, analog or digital ports. You can use them as analog or digital ports, 8 pins, you have 6 uh, ports, so 48 pins. Wonderful, good, very good. You can use them. There's nothing wrong with it. But also these ports are connected to some other circuitry elements, some other, how can I say, alternative functions. For example, port A can actually simulate and actually um, operationalize serial communication, which is called the UART serial communication in port A. Let me write it here. At port A, you have universal asynchronous receiver transmitter serial communication. Well, this is an alternative function because you need a circuitry for that. Just like the digital pad here you have for an I.O., you have a digital, digital uh, pad for this guy as well. And it's connected to port A. So port A can be used as pins to connect uh, more elements like LEDs, or also you can connect that alternative function of port A as well. And we're going to be using those alternative functions in the next semester's course. I, I told you, uh, if you're going, uh, th this will be the thing that you do if you're an embedded programmer. There's a digital pad and device, you'll be using that device. So just like we use this, we're going to see the architecture of the serial ports and we are going to, by changing their control registers, we can use it. And that control register is also connected to port A, but that's called the alternative function. Whatever different from the GPIO general purpose input output, we call it an alternative function. And for each port, we have an alternative function. For example, at port C, we have, a, we have an analog to digital converter. Imagine you have a sensor connected to your port C. Uh, there's a sens uh, sensor which provides different voltages for different temperatures, temperature sensor. Well, we need to convert those voltage values to digital values, like zeros and ones. That's called the uh, analog to digital converter. We have that. Yeah, digit, analog to digital converter. Good. Well, in this course, we are not going to use those alternative functions. We will disable the alternative function and use this guy, this pad, this circuitry, only for general purpose input output. That's why there is a control register for that as well. We are going to say the card, hey, I'm not going to use an alternative function. I'm going to be using this pad for general purpose input output. That's why I'm changing the bits in this register, one of the registers we are going to see, that pin, so that you under, that's a configuration. Okay. Okay, enable a specific alternative function. Or we can make the card on and off digitally enable the uh, pin. Because if I'm not going to use that pin, I'm not, I don't want to just, I don't want it to process. I can, there is an on off button for it. For the on off button, there is also, sorry, for the on off button, there is also a pin. And just like we've seen the previous week, for the direction of the, sorry, for the direction of the port, we also have a pin because I can connect a switch to a pin or I can connect a LED to a pin. A LED would be an output device. I would be writing to a place so that the LED would be on or for a switch, somebody would be pressing the switch or releasing the switch, I will be reading the uh, result of that switch. So that's one of them is input, one of them is output. The pad wants to know which one. Am I writing it? Am I reading it? So is this an input port? Output? We tell it, we configure the pad such that we tell the guy, this is an input port, that's an output port. Okay. So this card, there's a register for it. And this card, this pad is a circuitry. Every circuitry in a architectural, computer architectural uh, design needs a clock guys, because at each clock they process. Uh, in computer architecture, you see traces of this. Well, this pad, if you don't feed it a heartbeat, like a clock, so there's a clock connected to it, clock. If you don't feed it, it will freeze. But you may want to freeze it because, because of uh, energy saving. This card, when you're not, for example, you're doing something on the card and you are not using port C. You don't want to even feed clock to it. So you can stop feeding the clock to it. 
by using one of the registers here. So there is a register for that. So that you just don't feed any clock. So that you don't spend any energy because when the clock is fed there, the uh, circuitry, clock circuitry will reach some of the elements and it will require more, more current. Requiring more current for the card will mean spending more energy. We don't want that because this card is designed for mobile purposes. We want to spend the least energy we can. That's why we can just make this car, uh, make this on and off. So there's an, because it's a pull-up register. What is a pull-up register, guys? You've seen this in uh, Gucker's Circuit 2 and uh, Electronics 1. When you connect a circuit element, pull-up register is something like, I remind you, when you connect a circuit element like this, like a switch, guys, like a switch. Well, you are making, when you press the switch, actually you're making it, when, when you press it, it becomes a short circuit, right? So you're connecting this pin to the ground. That's something crazy, because when you some, connect something to ground, uh, ground, there will be infinite current going to the ground. There is no infinite current, but theoretically, you don't want that, because when you push this device to get infinite current, you might break it, just burn it. To prevent doing that, this device has uh, an already pull-up register inside. You may want to enable it if you're connecting a switch there because you're connecting something, one of the ports, a switch. You may need that. You can enable it or for some other purposes, maybe your switch has already a, a pull-up register. You don't want to do it. So even there's a register for it, for enabling that pull-up register for the port that you connect. So in this design, somewhere in the digital pad, there are pull-up registers already connected to each pin. And you can just enable them. And there is a register for reading and writing the data. The most important register actually it is this, give or take data. I didn't count all of the registers, guys. There are many registers. You might ask, what is this ODR for? What is this OCL for? What is this, this Paris pull-up register? What is this PDR for? What is this digital enable, this digital enable? So what are these for? I didn't tell all of them to you, guys. You don't have to know. We'll start with a simple configuration. And if you want to know, in the end, you're going to be uh, hardware programmers and you'll be using different cards in your lives. And I'm showing you only one card. So how, how are you going to do this in your lives? There will be a data sheet of that card. You're going to sit and read the data sheet. That's how it happens. But this is the logic. So you'll be practicing it simply on a card once. That's the pur purpose of this course, by the way. Okay, so for all these guys, I said there is a register and I'm giving you the name. So for uh, using it as an analog port, I have this register called GPIO port E, for example, port E's analog mode selection register. It's here, guys, analog mode selection register. So this is if this is one, I've got one here, as you can see, it's here. Okay. Alternative function selection register. Can you see the alternative function? I can't. Where's the alternative function? Yes, it's here. So it is here too. This is a port control register. We are going to use port control register to digitally enable it. So it's somewhere here. So where is the port control register? I can, if anybody can see, please tell me. Hocam, uh, en sol yes, evet. Thank you, thank you. So guys, we have these registers. And as I told you, as promised, these registers have certain address values mapped to them. So very simple code again, guys. Let me write a very simple code, LDR, R0. I'm creating a pointer to this location, guys. Okay, so the data register. And if I say something like str r1, r0, the value inside str, whatever it is, is being written to this register. That's how we connect them. So guys, this is like, do you remember the directive EQ? EQ was like creating constants. When you said something EQ, the compiler will read it like, whenever you, uh, the compiler see, sees this line of code, it will understand that this is the address. So you define these addresses in the beginning of your code, so from now on, you don't write this code, but instead 
you write something like this LDR R0 equals to GPIO port blah blah blah so that your code will make more sense when you're reading the code you're saying that oh I'm pointing R0 to the data register I'm pointing R0 to the other register so your code becomes more readable we are going to see some code today don't worry you'll make a sense of what it means okay any questions about these registers and how they function because we are going to get into the code uh, I mean slowly any questions we are uh, recording okay okay now let's start with the initialization initialization port configuration for example the regular function of a GPIO parallel port pins is to perform parallel IO, which means you have eight pins, you have eight pins, and you're going to send eight bits all together in parallel outside. And you have some eight pin device connected to it. You are sending some information out. That's called parallel port communication or whatever, GPIO. And as I told you, most pins have alternative functions. For example, port A0 and A1 can be regular parallel port pins just like we use, or they can be configured for universal asynchronous receiver transmitter serial communication, UART. We're not going to use that alternative function. We are going to configure it during port initialization. Some other ports AF is JTAG. JTAG is a certain type of debugging system using USB. Actually, you're using your USB to debug your card that, that is using JTAG, whatever. So when doing regular I.O., which is the context of this course. We are not going to do anything other than regular I.O. in this course, but in the next semester's course, we're going to be doing alternative functions, serial communication, analog to digital co conversion, whatever, and plus. So when doing that, you have to just close that, just switch that operation of alternative think, function off by doing a configuration, port configuration, port initialization. And there are many other controls we have to activate or deactivate before being able to use a port for a specific purpose. This is called port initialization or port configuration. Okay, so let's do it. Let's configure our port F for simple input output because why port F? Because you remember that in port F, we have already connected devices like switches, like LEDs. Let's, let's configure port F and see if we can ma make that work the switch uh, LEDs. Okay. The Launchpad Evaluation Board has already connected two switches and one three-color LED, which is connected to three pins of port F, which is port F, one, sorry, where is my, uh, so the LEDs connected to here, and the switches. Okay, the switches are negative logic and will require activation of the internal plop registers, which means, negative logic means, for a switch, when it's pressed, it is zero volts, zero. When it's released, it is one. That's called negative logic because uh, the circuit being on the pressing requires zero negative. So uh, positive logic means when it's pressed, it is one, but it is not the case. And these guys do not have their own circuitry. So you have to require the activation of the plop registers. That, that's an information that we get from the data sheet. Okay, the LED interfaces of PF3 and PF1 are positive logic, which means if we provide one to those bits, they'll be on. Okay, so to use the LEDs, we will have to make these pins of port F, sorry, these pins of port F as output pins. So we will have to change certain control registers, which designate the direction of that pit as output pins, and we'll activate the red color or whatever color we want to make, okay? So the blue color is PF2 and the green color is PF3. So by changing different values, we'll obtain different colors and we'll do that. So let's look at this uh, circuitry of it. So switches are negative logic, which means if you press the switch, it's going to be a short circuit. So when you press the switch, it's going to be zero volts. Both. So this is a positive logic. We don't have it here, but we have negative logic. This is our card. This is not our card, not our card. 
okay and the connections and similarly these are the leads these are positive logic and there's a nice graph here uh, let's talk about this graph because when you become digital electronics guys and analog electronics guys what you're going to do is you are going to be connecting analog and digital devices to microprocessors or microcontrollers and actually the led is so called a digital device but it also has analog properties and this shows the analog properties. It shows that, uh, it shows the amount of current that passed through it, given the voltage on both sides of the LED. So guys, if you provide voltage less than 1.5 volts, there is no current inside going through the LED, which means it will be off. So if you need to make it on, you have to provide voltages larger than this. And actually, this is something like it goes up to a voltage and it becomes saturated size, three volts, 3.3 volts. And if you increase it, of course it increases, I mean, but you don't have to just, we don't want to burn the lead. And in our cards, one volt, uh, actually digital, uh, one digital level, logic level one, logic level one means 3.3 volts. So at 3.3 volts, there will be a current in this uh, lead and it will make it on bright. And we're going to see this. Good, we know our elements. Now let's get to the initialization procedure. Guys, this is the initialization procedure for uh, making the LEDs on, not the switches. For the switches, we have a couple more steps. I will start with the simplest thing because the simplest thing in this card is to connect a digital output element because you'll make some pins one and zero, that digital output element will get that one and zero and react accordingly. If it's a LED, it's going to be on, it's going to be off. And how do I know that these are the steps, guys? Well, surprise, I've checked the data sheet in some pages of the data sheet. It tells me how to do it. And if you read all the explanations of all the registers in the data sheet, well, you can find that. Guys, where are the explanations and in which order I should make the configuration? Well, by reading the data sheet, you can understand that. But for the LED, I'm going to be giving you, so you don't have to just bother checking the data sheet, and I'm going to be telling you how. So to make the LEDs on, this is a procedure you do only once at the beginning. That's why it's called an initialization or configuration. And I will have to follow these steps. So at first step, I'm going to provide clock to the device. So there's a clock coming in. So there's a uh, enable for it, clock enable for it. So the clock is coming. So there's a clock here. And I'm going to connect the clock. If, if I make this one, that'll be clock. How to make it one? Actually, there's a register for it. And that register is called system control register. Uh, what was this? Something clock gate control GPIO. And by changing the values of that register, I can make a port get clock because without any clock, I cannot change any registers. The first thing I do is to feed a clock to this digital pad, all of the pad, because this is dead before I feed a clock to it. How do I feed a clock to it? It's written in page 340 in my data sheet. So the last thing in this hour, I'm going to go to the data sheet, guys. Let me go to the data sheets. Well, I'll open labs. This is the Launchpad officials user manual, and this is the microcontroller data sheet. Go to the data sheet. I'll go to the page as promised, as explained, 340. Wow, exactly there. General purpose input output run mode clock gate and control. I'll read the explanations. This in short RC blah blah registers register provides software, the digital path, the capability to enable and disable the GPIO models in run mode. So you're en enabling your GPIO in run mode when you're running your card. If you want to, to use the GPIO, you have to do this. That's an enable. When enabled, 
A module is provided module by module. It's meaning the digital path that IO, a clock, and access is the module registers are allowed. So without providing a clock, the control registers of this digital path, the module, the GPIO port, is not allowed because they are dead. I provide a clock. That's the first thing I do. When disabled, the clock is disabled to save power and access the module registers generate a bus fault. So when this is not a enabled, if you try to access the control registers, you will have a bus fault. What is a fault? What is an exception? What is an interrupt? I mean, we'll learn further in this course. Don't worry about it right now. The register provides the same capability as the legacy run mode clock coin blah, blah registers, specifically for the watchdog modules and blah, blah. Let's pass that sentences. We are not ready for that. So this register should be used to control the clocking of the GPIO modules. To support legacy software, don't just forget it. So a write to this register also writes to the corresponding with, these are some architectural details. So I'm just going to pass them. So look, look at this register, guys. This register is, where is that register? How to understand the specific place of that register, guys. As you can see, there's a play thing written here to understand the uh, uh, register place, the address. I have the base and the offset. I sum these two values up. When I sum them up, so 0, 0, F, I'm summing this one with this one, guys. So it makes a value like F0, uh, F608. Actually, this is the register. So this is the register. So I just got this. This register is RCGC GPIO register, is this. Okay? So if I try to reach this memory location, I'll be reaching this memory location, okay? And let me read the properties of this pin. It says that this memory play, at this register, we have 32 bits, okay? 24 bits are reserved, which means they are not used. Reserved means not used. So you just don't use them, not used. Only these eight pins, sorry, six pins are used. And what are their purposes? Let me just show you their purposes because it's written. So bits 31 to six reserved. These are not used. Don't try to change them. It won't change anything. But bit five, four, three, two, one, zero, they are used. And bit five, this one, this one, for example, this one, this one is written here, bit field five, bit field five, R5. GPIO port F run mode clock gate and control. When this value is zero, GPIO port is disabled. When this bit is one, the GPIO port F can receive a clock. So guys, if I'm trying to do an initialization, which will enable the clock going to port F, I'll have to change this bit, specifically this bit, guys. So at the first step, at the first step, let me just, I have to clear all drawings. At the first step here, I'm going to go to that register. I know the address of that register written data sheet. And I'm going to change that specific bit using my codes. How am I going to do that? We are going to uh, discuss in the next hour. Okay, any questions? Hocam bir şey sorabilir miyim? Please. Şimdi benim anladığım kadarıyla R5'in değerinin bir mi olması gerekiyor? Yani içine yes. bir mi yazmamız gerekiyor yes. yoksa? Yes, exactly. You have to make it one. Think of this just like a memory cell. Can you change a specific bit in a memory cell? when you know the address of it, because here you know the address of it. O zaman you can change it, right? Yeterli mi peki hocam? Sorry, can Yok. you, sorry? Yani mesela atıyorum ben R5'e 20 değerini atasam da çalışacak mı yoksa? It's a pin. It's a single bit. It's a bit. You can either make it zero or one. This is like a 32 bit registers, guys. This is a 32 bit register and this is a bit, bit. It's zero or one. You can make it 20. 
Pek anlamadım hocam. Ya. Uh, well, you know R0, right? In R0, the register we know, it's 32 mm -hmm. bits, right? You have 32 ones okay. and zeros, right? And the fifth one is either zero or one, right? This is like R0, mm -hmm. but it's a different physical place. Mm, okay. Okay, so uh, not that difficult, guys. Where is the GPIO port F system control? It's not here. It's somewhere in the cart. It's somewhere in the cart. So it is like a register here. So um, what was the name of the register? Cystic, this one, this guy, is like a 32-bit register with 0, 1, 0, 0 values. 0. It's 32-bit. We are changing a specific bit. That specific bit change will enable the uh, clock coming inside. Okay now? Okay. Bakalım. Biraz daha kod göreceksiniz. Kodları gördük. 